As Lewin said, we're reading from Romans chapter 3 and starting at verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore no one will be, de will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. And he did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Mel. Good morning, everyone. It's uh, really good to have you with us this morning. If we don't know each other, my name's Nils. I'm also one of the pastors here, and uh, it's a great joy to be together, especially on Good Friday. Um, so if you're visiting, if you just come for the first time, I hope that you feel right at home here with us, and I hope that in some way God addresses you and speaks to you through the preaching of his word. So why don't we pray that that would happen? Let's pray together, and then I'll, I'll uh, bring God's word to us. Oh Lord, won't you help us to see why this Friday is so good, why the cross is so important, and we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I think everybody understands, everybody seems to know that the cross is at the heart of the Christian faith. Even those who are not Christians understand that the cross is really at the center of what it means to be a Christian. The symbol for our faith is not a manger, it's not an empty tomb, it's not even a book. It's an execution device. It's a cross. Kind of a strange thing if you think about it. And that's because the death of Jesus is at the very center of our faith. Why? What's actually going on at that cross? Now, there are many ways to understand the cross. You could see what's happening there is somebody who was the victim of a political movement that tried to get rid of him. You could see Jesus on the cross as a martyr who is going to the cross on behalf of his followers. You could see Jesus on the cross as a selfless example, showing what it means to lay down our lives for others. Well, this Easter, we're looking at three words that help us get to the heart of what the cross is all about. And uh, we've looked at, at two, uh, one already. We've got one on Sunday to come. But today I want to talk about a word that I don't think you've used in ordinary conversation ever. In fact, I'm willing, if I was a betting man, which I'm not, I'd be willing to put money on it, that you've never used this word in ordinary conversation. Some of you have probably not even heard of this word before today. It is the word propitiation. Propitiation. Maybe if your kids grew up on that, um, that kid's song by Colin Buchanan, big words that end in shin. Anybody know that one? Okay, it's a really great song. You've deprived your kids if they've never heard of it. Big words at any time. Here's one of them, propitiation. He mentions this. And it's a word that we're going to try and get our heads around over the next few minutes because of all the things going on at the cross, this word, I think, gets to the very heart of it. Now, in the passage that was read, uh, it's there in verse 25. The problem is, in your Bible, it probably doesn't look like it's there because the translators generally don't use the word. Your, your uh, version that you might have in front of you probably says something like an atoning sacrifice. Okay, that's trying to translate this word propitiation. I think propitiation is a better translation, and I'll hopefully show you why that is, because it means something very specific. Well, what does it mean? Imagine with me this scene. Jim is married to Jane. I hope there's no Jims or Janes here. This is purely, uh, there are no actual uh, people, what do they say? No Real people involved, this is all uh, made up. Uh, they have a good marriage. They've been married for nearly 20 years. But recently, Jim has started to slip up. Little things, you know, dishes not done, that cupboard that Jane has been asking to have fixed for so long still remains unfixed. 
Things like no appreciation shown for those home-cooked meals, no compliments given anymore about how good Jane looks. Now, she's been willing to let most of that slide until Jim forgets their 20th anniversary. That was it. Jane is furious, and rightly so. Now, Jim, to his credit, soon realizes that there's a problem. He remembers. Of course, he remembers too late. And a simple sorry is not going to cut it. Not this time. There's damage that has been done. He knows there is only one thing that will fix this. Jewelry. I'm sorry needs to be accompanied with something that will pacify Jane's anger. As luck would have it, Jim remembers that Jane has had her eye on a very sparkly and expensive set of Tanzanite earrings. It's going to cost him, but Jim knows this is going to be worth it. This is the only way. And so sure enough, when Jim presents Jane, not only with a genuine apology, but with a genuinely sparkling pair of earrings, Jane's anger melts away and her wrath is satisfied. That is propitiation. And what Jim offered was a propitiatory sacrifice or offering to Jane. See, that's what the word means. It means an offering or a payment made in order to placate or satisfy someone's anger. It's what's needed when somebody's been offended. And that, that offense, that anger, needs to be dealt with in order for that relationship to be mended. So here it is in verse 25. God presented Christ on the cross as a, and the word is, propitiation through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. Well, three questions for us this morning. Let's start with the most obvious one. What is God angry about? If propitiation has to do with pacifying someone's anger, why is God angry? And you might say, I don't think God's angry at all. God and I are just fine. Well, the problem is the Bible clearly and explicitly tells us that God is angry. And he's angry with us. And he's angry for good reason. Now, to see this, we're going to go back just a few pages in your Bible to Romans chapter 1, just two chapters earlier, where we read these words. They'll all be on the screen. You can follow along with me on the screen. There we're told, the wrath of God or the anger of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and the wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. There it is. There's no dodging this one. The Bible tells us that God is angry, and the reason that he's angry is very clear. We're told here he's angry because the people that he's created to know him, to love him, to live for him, have turned their backs on their creator. We've taken what we know to be true, that God is real, that God is powerful. This is what the whole world puts on display for us as we look around the world is shouting that God is real, that he's powerful. We've taken that truth and we've suppressed it, verse, 20, verse 18 says. We've suppressed it. We've ignored it. We've denied it. We've pretended it doesn't matter. And instead of living under God's rule and in obedience to him, we've decided we can make a better life by forging our own way. And so we live in a world where everyone decides for themselves what's right and wrong. It's a suicidal strategy. Because how could we ever know better than the one who made us? And the tragic consequences are all around us. We're told in verse 18 that this world is marked by godlessness and wickedness. I hope I don't need to convince you that that is the nature of our world. Wars, crime, hatred, corruption. It's all around us. It's the evidence of a world that's turned its back on its creator. And then if that wasn't enough, not only have we ignored God, but the passage goes on to tell us that we've directed our worship that by right should be directed towards God, towards other things. Let me read from verse 21 of chapter 1. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. And although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. And they exchanged the glory of the immortal God or images made to look like birds and reptiles and animals and reptiles. Instead of glorifying God, in other words, instead of putting God at the center of our lives and all that we live for, we put other things at the center of our lives. Now we're too sophisticated to worship actual images, but whatever grabs our hearts, that's our, our God, isn't it? And it can be anything, it can be wealth and comfort and power and prestige, it can even be our family, good things. 
but become central things and push God out to the side. Now, can you imagine how offensive this must be to the God who made us when we turn our worship away from him and we worship a fake God? And so God is angry. But let me be clear, he's not angry in the way that you and I get angry. Most of our anger is uncontrolled. We fly off the handle. No, God's anger, uh, by the way, I spent a lot of time in traffic this week, so I experienced some anger. I don't get to travel a lot in traffic, but I was carting my daughter to the waterfront for a workshop every day this week. And man, in traffic, you have lots of opportunities to get angry. And it's uncontrolled, isn't it? But God isn't like that. God's anger is controlled, it's appropriate, and it's the right response to the evil that he sees in the world. In fact, it's actually the expression of his goodness and his justice. And it doesn't mean, the fact that God is angry doesn't mean for a moment that he doesn't love us. In fact, quite the opposite. The reason God gets angry is because he loves us. Now, if you're a parent, you'll know that anger and love are not necessarily opposites. You know, imagine if you find that your son has been taking drugs and is addicted to substances that could kill him. He's ruining his life. What do you do? You become angry, don't you? Furiously angry. Why? Because you love him. And the more you love him, the angrier you get at whatever is destroying his life. God is angry at the destruction he sees all around us because he loves us. But make no mistake, to fall under God's wrath and his anger is a terrifying thing. Well, what do we do about it? Here's the second question. What can we do about it? If God is angry, how do we propitiate, to use our big word for the day, how do we propitiate his anger? There must be something that we can do to make him happy with us again. Maybe there's a set of requirements that we could meet. Maybe we could try to be better people. Maybe from today onwards, we try to win his approval with kindness and charity and good deeds. Live the best we can. Or perhaps we, we, we try to commit ourselves to a set of rituals and sacrifices that will show how serious we are. Now, you see, the problem is we don't have what it takes to fix the mess we've made. We can't ever compensate for the guilt that we've racked up. And even if it was, if it was possible in theory, the problem is we'll never be able to pull it off. Because hard as we try, the problem is we're always working with wills and hearts that are bent away from God and bent towards selfishness and self-serving. Here's how Paul diagnoses the whole situation, uh, just before the passage we're going to look at in a second. But in chapter 3, here's the diagnosis. He says, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. No one who does good, not even one. Now you might say, well, that's ridiculous. I know good people. I know lots of good people. I know people who are even wanting to, to seek God and try and follow God with their lives. Well, that may be. What he's saying here is not that we're as bad as we could possibly be, but he is saying that every aspect of who we are, every part of our being, every part of who we are is corrupted by our sin and is guilty before God. And left on our own, nobody would actually seek after God. Because nobody really wants God to rule their lives. And even the good things that we try to do are often tainted, as uh, Alan prayed and admitted in his prayer, are even tainted by our own corruption. You know, we, try, we give to charity and we secretly hope somebody notices. Or we help somebody out and we really hope that they'll be grateful. And even better, they might pay us back one day. Now, see, the problem is we can't do it. Our good is not good enough to meet up to God's perfect standards. And of course, the easiest way to realize this is just simply to look at his standards, look at his laws, and just try and keep them even for a day. You know, some would be easier than others. You know, do not murder, do not commit adultery. Hopefully, you can pull that off. But then, no greed, no, no lying, honoring your parents perfectly, no other gods before the one true God. I mean, we're not going to get this right. Now, all God's laws do for us is make us realize that we don't stand a chance. Verse 19, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one 
will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law, by good deeds. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. The law is like this big mirror that shows us who we really are. It provides the evidence of our guilt. And it leaves us, what do they say in Afrikaans? With a mournful thunder. We have nothing to say to God. We're silent. We have to be. We know we're guilty. So now what? We're guilty. God is angry. We can't measure up. And we can't do anything about it. Well, this is Good Friday. This is the best Friday. Because what happened at the cross is what changed everything forever. So one more question. What has God done about it? What has God done about it? And have a look with me in chapter 3, verse 21. But, but now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. Now notice that word, but. It's the greatest word when you're in trouble and it looks hopeless. You know, there's been a terrible accident, but. We found a tumor, but. There is no one righteous, but. But God has made a way for sinful people to meet the right requirements that he calls us to meet. And all of the Old Testament scriptures, the law, the prophets, we're told here, point towards it. How? Verse 22. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Here's the shock. It's not about measuring up before God. Being right with God is about trusting in Jesus. Turns out it's not about what we do, it's about what he has done. And all, we're told, who put their faith in him, verse 22, are given the righteousness that God wants from them. It's a gift. God looks at us and he says, let me give you the righteousness that you need. You, you present this before me one day when you stand before me. Now, how could God do that? Well, let's carry on. Verse 22, there is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We're all in the same boat. Nobody gets off. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Now, that, there's a lot in verse 24. There's some important words in this verse. And, and each of them gets in a different way at what's happening at the cross. Notice the word grace. I mean, is there a better word than grace? And that tells us that whatever Jesus did for us, it is completely undeserved. That's what grace means. It's a gift. It's given to us as we come to him empty-handed. Then the word redemption. That redemption is the word we looked at last Sunday. If you weren't here, it's on our, our YouTube channel. Go and have a look at Louis's message from last week. And as he explained to us last week, it's a, it's a word that actually comes from the ancient slave trade. If you were a slave in the ancient world, you couldn't set yourself free. You belonged to the one who was your master unless somebody paid the price for your life. That was redemption. They could buy you out of slavery, could buy your freedom by paying a price. And, and what we're told here is that the cross, that's happening. Jesus is paying a price in order to release us from our slavery and to set us free. His life is the price of our freedom. And because he offers his life and because he swaps places with us, notice verse 24, God can now, here's another word, God can justify us. Now, we're going to think a lot about this word next term, next week, uh, week after next, actually, as we, um, uh, no, next week, that's right, next week is a new term. As we uh, embark on the book of Galatians, it's all about this word, justification, or to be justified. It's a legal term, and it simply means this. It means to be found not guilty. It means that the criminal record has been taken away. You know, think back to that son who's got caught up in drugs. Maybe he, uh, he got caught dealing, and he ends up in jail. Redemption would be getting him out of jail, right? Setting him free. Justification would be getting all the charges dropped and cleaning his record as if he never committed the crimes in the first place. Now, imagine that happened. You're his parents. You managed to get him out of jail. You managed to get the charges dropped. You know he did it, though. What's the problem? The problem is, even though he's free and his guilt has been taken away, you're still angry with him, and rightfully so. Because you love him. You see, even if we've been set free, redeemed, even if we've been declared not guilty, God still has the right to be angry with what has happened. 
We've deeply offended him. And how do we ever make up for that? If somebody does something terrible to you, you know that it's not enough just to say sorry to mend that relationship. It's easy to forgive. It's hard to be reconciled. Well, now we come to verse 25 and that word, propitiation. God presented Christ as a propitiation through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. You see, as we look at the cross on Good Friday, what we see is not just a price paid to redeem us, not just a punishment taken to justify us, we also see a sacrifice offered to satisfy God's anger against us. And notice who makes the offering here. Who is taking this initiative? This is not a case of Jim trying to figure out what's going to make Jane happy again. God presented Christ as a propitiation. God makes the offering in order to appease his own anger. I mean, isn't that incredible? You know, sometimes people look at this and they say, this sounds a bit like some sort of you know, pagan religion. Here we are trying to you know, pacify the angry gods, like the ancient Aztecs or the, the Celts or the, you know, the Canaanites. They all had human sacrifices, people offered in order to try and make the gods happy again. Is this what's going on? Not at all. Because we aren't doing anything here. This is God's work. He offers the sacrifice. He makes amends for us. And the sacrifice that he makes is himself. He offers his own son as the propitiatory sacrifice. Think of how incredible this is. The one who's been offended does everything to fix the offense that's caused and to reconcile us to himself. And he does it again because he loves us. So on the cross, the full might, the righteous might of God's anger against our sin and our guilt is poured out not on us, but on Jesus. He drinks the cup of God's wrath right down to the bottom. That's why we celebrate uh, the, the cup as we drink together, as we celebrate the Lord's Supper in a few moments. We're remembering that Jesus drank that cup for us. Like a great lightning conductor, he absorbs the full might of God's wrath and anger directed towards us on himself. We can't even begin to fathom what that means as Jesus went to the cross. It's not about the physical suffering. What's going on behind the scenes is what tormented Jesus in that garden as he looked ahead and as he asked if there's any other way. But of course there wasn't. And so he went to the cross. Not reluctantly, he went to the cross because he loves us. This is how um, John puts it in one of his letters. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 9, John says, This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son, and here's the word again, as a propitiation for our sins. God's love and God's anger are not opposites. He sends Christ to pacify his anger. How do you get it? How do you benefit from all of this? Well, by faith. By faith. That's what the passage says. You simply have to trust him. You have to give your life over to him and say, Lord, I've messed up. I'm guilty before you. I've got nothing to say and nothing to offer. But Jesus has done everything for me. And I trust him. And if you've done that, you are his. And the wonderful thing then about Good Friday is that God is for you. He's never going to be angry with you again. If you can't remember the word propitiation, maybe you go home and they say, what did you learn about it? Oh, propiti something. I can't even remember the word. At least remember that God, it means God is pro you. That's what the word means. God is now pro you. He's on your side. He loves you. He's for you. And so you never have to wonder again whether God might be displeased with you, angry with you whether perhaps he doesn't love you. Maybe you've had that thought before. Christ has gone to the cross for you. He could not possibly love you more. So what do we do? Well, we offer him everything back. We offer him our lives. With a whole realm of nature mine, that would be an offering far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Let's pray together.
just be quiet for a few moments and maybe you want to respond to God in some way. Maybe you haven't spoken to God for a while or ever. Just say to him that you would like to receive this gift of salvation, that you entrust your life to Jesus. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and gave his son as a propitiation for our sins. O oh Lord, today we are left in awe of your love for us. That you would go to such lengths in order to win us back, despite our rebellion against you. So we thank you for the cross. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ who reconciles us to yourself because of his death. O oh Lord, help us to give you our all, to offer everything that we are, everything that we have back to you, and to live for you, knowing that this is why we were created. So I pray, Lord, that you would help the truths of Good Friday to ring in our hearts and in our minds as we leave this place. And as we come to the Lord's table now to celebrate what you achieved, Lord, may it be really meaningful for us as we partake together in Christ's death on our behalf. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.